Hello, I'm Bill Fawcett. Welcome to Ring of Fire Con. This virtual panel is Stories in Role Play Gaming. Storytelling and how it involves and circles around and is involved with the various aspects of RPGs. And we have an amazing group of highly experienced, widely knowledgeable period people that are going to speak to us on it. And uh, we'll let each of them introduce themselves, some of whom you probably won't need much introduction on, but we'll begin with seniority. So Steve, Steve Jackson. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Steve Jackson. I've been doing this since 1977. Uh, I guess the first story that I told in a game was not even role playing, it was uh, Ogre which is very much a story when you play it out, uh, uh, a story of either heroism or mindless destruction, depending on which side you take. Uh, but I also started work on my first role-playing game that year, Fantasy Trip, which has come full circle 40 years later and uh, is out again. In the middle, I did the GURP system as well as Car Wars and Munchkin and Illuminati and a few others that you've probably played. And that's me. Okay, Rick. Oh, uh, hi, well, I'm Rick Hines. I am nowhere near as illustrious or famous as Mr. Steve Jackson with his games that I grew up playing. But um, my thing is I am the writer of GM Tips on Geek and Sundry after Matt Minister and CT took it, which is all about how to storytell. I run panels on how to not suck at storytelling where we joke about the worst mistakes and stories that we've ever made and how to correct them. But uh, as a writer, I write the uh, urban fantasy series called The Seventh Age, which is sarcastic urban fantasy about the end of the world. But currently, my focus is on teaching people how to become storytellers uh, through a project I have called the Storytellers Forge that's primarily focused on kids. And um, the Red Opera, which is tying metal into full narrative campaigns and music as ways to enhance immersion around the table. Uh, I got into role playing uh, through Wraith the Oblivion and through like the White Wolf uh, aspects back in the, the 90s. So I've done everything from run big giant mega events to uh, standing in a trench coat outside of, you know, the Riverwalk uh, playing rock, paper, scissors at three o'clock in the morning. Marion. Well, I'm Marion Harmon. Uh, I became a professional writer back in 2010 when I lost my job in the, in the real estate crash. Um, I am the author of the Wearing the Cape uh, book series, which is book eight now is, was out last year. Book nine should be out this year, knock on wood. Um, it's highly successful superhero novel novels, so, so straight prose superhero fiction. And uh, that is a small but very uh, quickly growing pool. Um, as for my gaming background, uh, I started all the way back with uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition. Uh, Empire of the Petal Throne is one that I picked up but unfortunately never played. Um, all the way through college, picked up GURPS. Thank you very much, Steve, for that. And we played Ogre before that, incidentally. I see you're wearing the shirt. Um, and that took us all the way through, I think I played every single RPG I got my hands on all the way through college and probably every single superhero game as well. So ironically enough, when I, when I did my first, my first novel for my, my uh, Wearing the Cape, um, I statted out all of my uh, characters using GURPS supers. So uh, just... And that's again going back to going back to that. That's one of the things, obviously, where it all ties together. And then coming full circle, I sponsored and, and helped write and make a uh, a superhero RPG for my book series. And that kind of what brings me here today. So, right. And so, if you use GURPS to create your book, you paid the royalty to Steve. <laughs> Those no, are for private no. use only. That's not how it works. Ah, oh, darn. <laughs> I'm also, by the way, a participant. I'm Bill Fawcett, and I've been around since I started writing articles for Dragon Number no. One for TSR and doing the center game for the first 45 issues, reviewing miniatures. Well, there's three of us, so we did everything we had to, basically. After that, I founded a little company called Mayfair Games and ran the Roll Aids role play line, started writing books. I have a few dozen out and that kind of thing. So I I've, I've sort of been around in it to the, from when I had hair. 
<laughs> way to put it. And that was a long time ago. So welcome to this. And the topic is storytelling in gaming. And Steve was nice enough to uh, provide us with a couple of kickoff questions that um, we probably can uh, use to begin the discussion. The first of which is, is storytelling the same as role playing? It, a, a, a definition of um, the, my partner at Mayfair gave me of role playing was quantitized interactive storytelling. Is it storytelling? Is creating a role play game a storytelling experience? Is playing a role playing game a storytelling experience? And do you write it that way when you're creating it? Steve, since you're on screen, go ahead. Okay, have to take my own question. Well, I would say that writing a role playing game is not necessarily storytelling. It certainly can be. It sort of depends on how much splat you put into it. But either acting as a game master or playing a role playing game is storytelling. I will stick my neck out and say that if you're not storytelling in either of those roles, you are doing it wrong. Rick. Uh, so um, my, my take on this one is, 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 is different. I, I think that when you're writing a game, you definitely have to field for player agency and you have to, you can be a world builder and you can tell a story through that. But you know, even if you have a lot of narrative and a lot of fluff in, in there, um, you're still trying to create a sandbox for the players to tell their own stories, which means that yes, when you're playing the game or running the game, you are intrinsically storytelling because that is the entire purpose. I mean, when you look at the terms that people use to identify storytellers, uh, whether it be dungeon master, game master, storytellers, you can actually tell where somebody grew up in role-playing games by the, uh, the, the taglines of how they define themselves as an ST. Since I came from White Wolf, I always say ST, but you know, dungeon master and, and game master and other types of you know, moderators from uh, you know, Aberrant and other game systems, they all have different things. So yes, I guess long and short, storytelling is totally um, an aspect of writing games or, or running and playing the games, but writing, I don't know. I think uh, at that point you're world building. Marion? Well, I've got to go with Rick on the world building. And that goes back to my first experience when I was doing the wearing the cape books. I, I basically treated it like I was doing a world build for an RPG. I wanted to have the background solid in my head so that uh, the more solid it is for you and the more detail you have, and this goes into RPGs as well, um, the more coherent it all hangs together dramatically because you are trying to create an experience when they pick up your RPG and they play it. So you want to have all of the hooks, uh, you know, coming from the right directions and being there for your players to grab onto so they're not simply murder hobos uh, running around, you know, shooting things and, and getting experience. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, that world building background that also go, is intrinsic to uh, writing books, then they're not going to have that kind of a storytelling experience in your game. Without disagreeing with that in the least, I'm going to dance around the edges of it. Um, I would say that some game writers are novelists inside and they need to do what you did and go write their novel rather than perhaps loading a role-playing book down with so much world building that they are taking away player agency. The player, the player needs to feel that they are important to the game, even if their character is not important to the world. 100% actually, Steve, I agree. Um, this idea that you have, um, when you're writing the game or creating the world, you could like writing a campaign adventure, uh, like we're doing with the Red Opera is completely different. Um, but writing a campaign setting, you have to provide the storyteller the tools so they can do it. You have, uh, because players need to be able to shape and change that world. So I guess that kind of is, I mean, that's kind of what all three of us are saying. At the end of the day, the storytellers are the ones who are doing the running. Uh, the players are the ones who are also doing the storytelling. But when you're creating the game system, you got to be able to offer story hooks up on a platter so that the people who are actually going to be playing it are going to do it. Because otherwise, just go write a novel yourself. 
Right. The sandbox has to be full of sand, not finished buildings. Yeah, I would agree with that. Let, let's go into a little more detail on this. How much, since we have three of our top RPG designers here, how much do you need to provide if you're doing, say, uh, to go to an old example we were discussing before this started else, how much, how much does the world affect the story and the material you present in a source book or a background book or a world book versus it's just a bunch of things that they can build on? How much story can you build into a background book? Because I've seen where they're a lot like EPT or a little like many of the GURPS. Um, Marion, why don't you start since we made you go last every time. Okay, um, I think, well, part of it's a matter of taste because you can have GMs who want all the stuff. They want all of it because the more details they have, the more chances they have to spark inspiration off of something that sounds fascinating and the more stuff they have to offer the, the players. Uh, but there are, are a lot of GMs and groups who just want the bare bones rules of the world and then to explore it and, and discover it and even, even write the background themselves as they go and bring in associations that they create for the characters. Let's, so let's, you can play it either way. Let's go a little more specific. How much can you put in before you're forcing them to tell your story? At what point do you start? And everybody here has done background books. Everybody here has done role play scenarios. How much can you put in before you're constraining the writer too much? When do you know that's happened? For me, yeah. it was 30 pages. Well, 30 pages? <laughs> yeah. 30 pages of world background and all the rest of it had to be the rules. Uh, but I've only got the one game under my belt. I'm, I don't have the experience you guys do. Yeah, don't go humble on me. <laughs> Rick. Um, so uh, Legend of the Five Rings and White Wolf Vampire the Masquerade are two examples of incredibly plot canon heavy uh, game systems that are immensely successful, right? Uh, there is a full narrative arc. There's like the Giovanni Chronicles. There's this entire... Um, there's this entire plot line that is already there and developed and the rules are, are arguably, you know, shoved, shucked into the back of the book and they're, and they're very minimal. When, so those are like incredibly drought heavy where the story, the hooks, everything are there, even including NPCs, fictions, you have everything in those books. Whereas you take something like Rifts, for example, which is here's this awesome world or Shadowrun even, where you have this really cool cinematic world. And so those things allow the storytellers to build their own adventures within that sandbox. Um, d and is on the flip side. So how much can you put in? That gets down to a completely storyteller specific, what product are you looking for? I could run a great game with just a Jenga tower in a dread scenario. And that's the only rules that I need. Um, Opposite of uh, Marion here, uh, I, I tend to be far more story heavy with lots of conspiracies and plot lines uh, that are in the world as adventure hooks. And my rule sections tend to be like this big, like, you know, 15 pages, because I'll let the storytellers grab the rule set that they want uh, for their world, but I'll give them a thousand hooks. Steve, you've, you've had products that run the gamut of this. Do you want to speak about how you approach some of the different products from GURPS? It really depends on the background and the story. Um, you can get more, more, of a, more of an arc, I think, looking at GURPS on one side or Empire of the Petal Throne, far heavier even, and then Tune on the other side. Uh, where you're, you're all cartoon creatures and the worst that can happen is you fall down. No, uh, I, I would say that, uh, that my fellow panelists have covered the waterfront on that. It depends. It really depends on your material. There is also a distinction we might not have been clear on. Uh, there is a distinction between background detail and narrative detail. Uh, you can have a background heavy Rifts is a good example of that, background heavy. I mean, the background is huge, mm -hmm. but Rifts doesn't have all that much narrative. They leave it to you to decide what plots are advancing here, what kinds of characters are gonna be heavily involved in, in, at least the last time I looked at it. They've been through a couple iterations since I saw it. So, and then on the opposite, you, you have the, the ones that you mentioned where the narrative is a thing and you kind of bring the readers, the players into the narrative that is like a, like a tide almost, that they just kind of have to survive. 
I've, I've had a theory in our industry that this is a little cyclical. When we first started out with the box set of D&D, it was a campaign with, at the end of, mostly rules. And as it, even as TSR developed, you got Alpha Omega and some of the others, and then the spy one that they did, Top Secret. Mm -hmm. And they became more content-specific conspiracy event driven by the story and not the rules kind of thing. And that continued on to the EPT. And Steve, your early role play game was more rule, I think, than driven as well, wasn't it? It was very rule driven. It originated in a game that was just a tactical simulation for fantasy combat. Melee, correct? I, I wasn't satisfied with the combat in D&D because you couldn't tell where anybody was, which meant you couldn't hide behind anything. One thing led to another. <laughs> and, uh, it's amazing how much combat has inspired what we did in the rest of role play. As everyone knows, the early D&D &D was actually a series of narrative stories about how you'd run your chainmail into the other guy's chainmail castle. Yes. I wasn't in that. I came a generation later. Which is, which is <laughs> definitely funny because we've gone back to um, grid combat and like that kind of idea of, of using the minis and the maps uh, mm -hmm. definitely had a much bigger push a few years ago. We're actually seeing a swing back to more theater of the mind type storytelling, which is more just descriptions and role playing and character act interactions at the table. One thing I've, I've noticed is that for new players and new storytellers coming into a game system, they tend to prefer uh, game systems that are allow them to build their own world with just some loose background information because there's not a lot to dive into. Uh, whereas the more evolved a group got or somebody that's already cut their chops on a few different game systems, they too, they want to like get into the, give me the lore of Legend of the Five Rings or let's dive deep into these these narrative arcs um, is is what we see when I interview or talk to storytellers all the time. As I said, it seems to be simple. We'll build up to it, and then we'll get a role playing, playing uh, emphasis for a while, and then we'll we'll start to get spin off worlds that are very specific that you play exactly how it should be, your shadow runs and things like that. In the third generation of role play games, and I've seen it like round and round. I think what that says is that they're both fun, and as you get a generation cutting its teeth on one style they reach an age where they look around and say, what else can we do? And whatever they seize on is the opposite of what they were, uh, what they were first exposed to. Yeah, marketing generation is nine to 11 years, and I think it fits this cycle nicely. Okay. The fifth edition is back to the tabletop right now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> fifth edition right. is back to first edition in so many ways, and trying to put more emphasis on storytelling again. So, yeah, it's the cycle goes round and round. How much we're getting more storytelling now? You guys also write books, many of you, few of you, and I've uh, been involved in the book industry for about forty years as well. Uh, I used to pack, create series and package the series and work with writers for publishers. Um, I've watched over this period a massive surge of reading and interest in science fiction and fantasy. When we started in the 70s, it was an isolated little pocket and you couldn't hardly find anything. And now after, you know, we're what I call the post Harry Potter world, <laughs> where, you know, only seven of the top 10 bestsellers are fantasy or science fiction this week in New York Times, who used to not even list us. Right, Geeks um, inherited the earth. We, yeah, we <laughs> Thank won. you, J.K. Rowling. Yep. And um, do, do you think that the, the new emphasis on fantasy and role play in, or fantasy and science fiction and hero in television, movie and books has affected the games? How much do you think they've affected the games? Steve, you've had this perspective. Uh, it has certainly increased the pool of players. It's increased the pool of players hugely. Uh, whether it has affected the game other than by providing more source material, I couldn't say. Not that that's unimportant, but we were always going to have ideas whether they were on the bestseller list or not. The players were always going to have ideas. Are you recruiting your readers into your games? 
Marion, Rick, either of yes. you? Yes. Uh, Is that, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Rick. Oh, no, you can, uh, well, okay, I'll go. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, most of, well, for me, they've always been tied, right? When I was running these 600 man, like live action games and the river walks and, and, and doing these big, uh, big events, um, we were crafting such like incredible stories that the game had become almost like a full-time job. I had actually sort of started to lose myself in uh, a lot of, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday nights dealing with game drama and stories that were there. So when I took a step back, I found that I really wanted to still tell stories. And that's why I decided to start becoming a writer and actually crafting novels. And so the nice thing about role players is they craft beautiful characters. And what's to answer like your question on like, are we recruiting readers? Uh, are we recruiting our gamers into readers? Absolutely. Um, mostly because I tend to write in a world, uh, my Seventh Age series is is heavily inspired from a lot of the characters and people that I've encountered or run, and I've taken their plot lines and reworked them and redistilled them down to you know be you know fitting for the the setting. But there's so much overlap. I go to conventions and I do anime conventions. I'll do comic con conventions as a writer uh, in that space because. That is where there's a huge, diverse crowd of people who are always interested, and there's so much crossover now between uh, games, video games, books, movies, uh, because right now it is cool. Pop culture is geek culture. Uh, it is no longer like a nerdy thing to be like, oh, I like Star Wars. I'm so weird and so so geeky and nerdy. It's like, no, that's just pop culture now. You know, yeah. that's 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 where it's at, and which is awesome because the more people who get to be involved in a fandom, no matter where they come from, the better it is. Uh, that's better for everybody. And it makes it really cool that this stuff gets to be put out there and everybody gets to take part of it because we all love being lost in our imaginations. And so I think that that is something that everybody should have access to. And I, along with agreeing with almost everything you say, I just had one thought. Are, are you married? Me? Uh, not anymore. I am divorced. Um, I was going to say, either you married a gamer or... I did. Uh, my, yes, my very much. Tried to list Gary as correspondent and guilty for the divorce. So I married a gamer the second time. Steve had a gamer for a partner as well. Marion, you were going to comment. I was just going to say that in my case, I was recruited. I, I, I didn't recruit readers. I was recruited by them. Uh, about the time that I finished the fifth book in the Wearing the Cape series, um, I was getting a bunch of, of fan mail. Well, fan mail these days is basically reviews on Amazon and stuff. But uh, but I was getting a, a, a bunch of feedback and a bunch of them are going, dude, 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 you got to do a superhero RPG based on your book. And after I'd heard this for about maybe two years, um, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. And I went looking and um, I don't know if you know much about OGL open game licenses. Mm -hmm. Very much. Okay. Um, unfortunately, well, Steve, for I, listeners. Okay, well, um, an open game license is where somebody has created a gaming platform, so they got the system for creating characters, the, the base framework without the world building. It's just, just the framework of the rules. And they have released that into the wild, so anybody who wants to can use it. I believe the, the biggest example is, D, is it D6 or D, uh, D20. 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 D20 is one of the biggest. Um, Steve, you really ought to do that to GURPS. People have probably been telling you that for years. But um, uh, as a matter, if you had, I would have used you. We could have ago. a great argument about that if we wanted to, <laughs> to burn the rest of the panel. Yeah, we, we could. But anyway, so I, I, went, I went looking and I finally settled on Fate, which I say settled because it's an awesome storytelling engine for collaboration between the, the GM and the, and the players. And um, also very rule light. So it allowed me to devote most of my, well, probably about half of the book to the meat. Um, and I, I basically, I finished it up. I did a Kickstarter for the publication costs and uh, paid the artist out of my own pocket because I figured it would fly. I, I recouped my money and made a bit on it, I think. But um, it was basically to the fans of here, here you go. You know, <laughs> are you happy now? And they said, yes, give us a supplement. So I did that too. <laughs> um, and I don't know if I'm going to go anywhere from there. I'm, I'm doing some other things related to it. While I'm try desperately trying to finish my book nine. But so I kind of got sucked back into it. It was not a plan for me. It just happened because I had a lot of fans who were reading my stuff who were gamers. So yeah, there's, there's a huge draw between those two. Um, one observation, and then I wanna go back to what Steve said. 
the observation is knowing that we are now a pop culture and not a minority. We are effectively driving much of the rest of America's culture. I also do history and military history. We were filming a show called History of the Navy Seals. We had a, it was about 10, 12 years ago. We had a grizzled 50 something master chief from the Navy, the kind that frightens men in the use in movies and frightens <laughs> new recruits and ensigns. Mm -hmm. Talking about, they were on a mission in the desert and they pulled into a village and there was a wall, little wall on one side of the village and a big dune beyond it. And they started taking fire from the dune and all dived behind the wall. And he said, and I thought about trying to fight it out. And then he looked at the screen and said, but I decided we didn't have enough hit points. I called him an airstrike. And I, at that point, I realized that a 50-year-old Navy men who probably never played D&D &D in their life are referring to their combat strength as hit points. We've, we've won. captured. We've captured the culture. Yes, we've we won. It's us. Then again, you know, he he might have been a druid maiden on weekends. <laughs> it is possible. I have played with some, and the funny part is, when you play with those really good field people, they think their way out of it, and there isn't much combat. It's very frustrating for the DM. Oh There's, no, that's where you get to do the right. awesome blossom stuff, right? Oh, it's when great. you have right. when you have the the players that are gonna like think their way around every box and you've like written your entire encounter over here and then all of a sudden uh they like zig and zag on you, you're like, Oh, okay, cool, consequences. And now it's um, in prof theater time, yes. At, at one point they asked me how many they had left behind or snuck past during that scenario. We counted them up, and I had about 150 characters ready to jump them that they were way beyond and couldn't get back to. <laughs> yes, and they were going, chuckle, chuckle, we're good. <laughs> Those are the ones you want to give first level characters and say, here's a knife. Now, you know, go, go play. No, 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 no. That's too much like real life. Um, <laughs> Steve, you mentioned about open license and thinking about it with Gertz. I think it's worth a couple of minutes for you to, to take that a little further and why you've made the decision you have on it, which, by the way, were exactly the same ones we made at Mayfair. <laughs> well, uh, it was really a quality control thing. Uh, I wanted the the name GURPS to represent a certain level of quality, to to have a meaning to players. And I decided that that was more valuable than the exposure that would come from having the title on a lot of third-party produced stuff. Because third-party material really runs the gamut from, oh my gosh, let's make a deal and make that official, to this is embarrassing. James Kirk is an ocelot or something. <laughs> <laughs> Flash material, maybe. And yeah. So, I mean, as um, somebody who's going through the open gaming license stuff right now, um, I actually have a personal experience on this one to, to share. Uh, you know, like I had mentioned earlier, we're doing this this Red Opera thing, right? Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're taking, uh, I, I've crafted this 120,000 word uh, campaign where we take a bunch of warlocks through the city of the Shadelands um, on this epic campaign in, in Quest that has a ton of player agency. It's built with everything from, from the get-go. But our big hook to it was that we actually had the Budapest Scoring Symphonic Orchestra, we had the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame, and we based it and inspired it from a, a heavy metal album called uh, The Red Opera by, by Dia Morte. And you know, I'm a system agnostic storyteller. It doesn't matter to me what game system I use. I'll grab a freaking Jenga tower and throw it on my table and call it a day, no problem. Uh, but we had to do uh, fifth edition uh, D&D because that is where uh, the market is right there and they have an OGL for it. And we, as a small indie studio, have done an amazing job going through providing like high tier quality art, you know, everything. And people have asked us, why didn't you go uh, to TSR? and say, hey, I have, or go to Wizards and say, hey, I have this, this book, you know, can we come up with a deal and, and, and publish it? Honestly, the real answer to that is we don't know who to talk to. You know, when things are behind, I can go look up and read an article on an open gaming license and know that I have to go to Kickstarter and here's where I can create this stuff. But to the barrier for new content creators to get their works published, 
um, to find out who you're supposed to go to uh, is incredibly high. And I'm in the gaming industry, right? I was like, I don't even know who to talk to about going about this. I have this other project, uh, the Storytellers Forge, which is all about teaching kids how to become storytellers. I don't even know where to begin on that, right? Like that's a, you know, a whole different aspect. And so to me, as a content creator, the OGL is incredibly important because it allows me to find my own path through publishing. Because I, if you don't have those industry connections, those are barriers of entry. And I understand quality control, um, you know, and if somebody came to, you know, Apotheosis Studios and t after they looked at the Red Opera and was like, this is awesome, uh, we wanna make this official, we don't even know how that process looks. And there's just not enough education out there for content creators to offer us guidance on what we should be doing or where we should go. One thing about that process is it would look slow. By yes. remaining indie, you were able to remain agile and things happened a lot faster. And you did not have to worry about anybody saying, an opera soundtrack? That's weird. And holding you up for two weeks of meetings. Right. Mm. Okay. Wizards? Probably Kim or their design person, sometimes Jim. Um, then you go up to the, because of you're doing what you're doing, you go to the, to the education and young, young adult section of Hasbro Bradley for approval. Then it would go to the board and marketing department of Hasbro Bradley for approval. Then it would come back down to Wizards where they would decide whether the content was appropriate and they wanted to go with you or just run with something similar. And then you would get assigned to one of their producer types who would then discuss the product with you. Is that well, that time you're all I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that, that's there and they, they, that lays that out. And then so you have to ask, isn't it just easier to form your own studio and go run a Kickstarter? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it absolutely. Is. That's why I gave you the example. <laughs> yeah, now, this is described about an 18 month process. Yes. Now, this is not what I would call the, the be all and end all template when we're, if we're still talking about OGLs a little bit and quality control. Um, you guys are familiar with Evil Hat, of course. Yes, I love Evil Hat. Um, right. Now, Evil Hat, basically what they did was on the issue of quality control, they have OGL. So they have absolutely no quality control over anything that's, that's fate based. Okay. It, it, and like you said, Steve, it, 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 there's the gamut. You can look on Drive Through RPG and some other sources. And they go everywhere from professionally looking to publish to somebody made a trash can book, if you know what I mean, if you know what those are. Um, no, tell us. Well, the, the trash can book was the old comic book where they, they in the pre-publishing days, where, or, or um, uh, pre-modern publishing days, where the, where the uh, comic book artist could only fold together something like 10 pages of white paper or something like that printed on the, and they used to call those trash can books. Okay. I, I have no idea why. Um, and they were usually incredibly primitive looking. Um, but what, what um, Evil Hat did was they based their reputation on the Evil Hat brand quality. So if you're out there looking at fate stuff, if it's Evil Hat fate, you know it's a certain level of quality and a certain style and they have trained their, their uh, fans to expect that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then they tell them flat out, you know, there's a ton of other uh, self-published stuff out there some better, some worse, go out, you know, go look and, and find inspiration, go and be free. Um, mm -hmm. But our stuff, you know what you're going to get when you get our stuff. And to me, Steve, that was always Steve Jackson Games. I always knew whatever you guys were doing, because it was Steve Jackson Games, the level of quality was at a certain level. I was always going to have a good time. That, that, that is the model we had. We had the same decision at Mayfair mm -hmm. when we did the DC Heroes game. They own the characters, but we own the system. And there was serious approach to us to let it for other people. They were going to use it for the champions computer game paper version and stuff, but we had no control over what they do with it. And it would degenerate and depreciate the DC game if the quality was, and we didn't want people to have to question it. So like Steve, we stuck with the core and didn't want to have something so wide that we might get lost in the noise or at least splashed on with a little dirt. <laughs> So that was a concern as well. Uh, getting back to putting together Very a role play game um, and, and bringing it out and putting a storyteller. 
I'd, I'd like to ask which of you, what won't you let, let people put into your role play storytelling rules, games and scenarios? What things would be forbidden? And we're talking a pretty wide range. I mean, there's a lot, those of you who are doing things about werewolves and vampires, is, LARPs and stuff, uh, have a little more range than the rest of the, the market, but into a print book. What, what it, is there verboten things? Is there anything you won't allow absolutely. on screen? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I will not allow anything dealing with rape, fascism, uh, you know, topics of, of hate. Uh, I always make sure people put in a, a black card. I tend to write a lot of horror. So, you know, this means that in, in, these, in these settings, people will want to go through into these darker things. And even when you're looking at a freelancer writer's work or something like that, sometimes they'll, they'll dabble into uh, a tropey topic that has... Um, you know, sort of been beaten ad hoc. Oh, the girl gets captured, you know, and, you know, you get to go save or there's that tokenism that's there. Um, and I will absolutely stay away from, you know, anything that we aren't subject matter experts on. Um, and if I need to write something that's about a subject matter expert type topic, I'm going to go find somebody to go write that, that chapter. But in my game systems and in the, the stories that, that we tell, uh, we will have tragedy, we will have death, we will have everything else, but there are just some topics that in today's culture, and frankly, we can do a whole lot better going forward that just are no longer part of the gaming system. Um, that are like, okay, we do not need to have rules in here for, uh, like, there was actually a game system that violated rules for like, you know, seduction and sexual assault. And it was like, okay, why did you even bother putting rules for this in your game system, you know? If they're not a satire, it's embarrassing. Marion. I haven't even begun to consider that topic yet, but I'm, I'm going to go with Rick on this. Um, in the most general statement I would give is you've got to control the tone because the tone is your brand. And so whatever anybody else does, they've got to, they've got to be true to that tone and brand. Steve, you've had plenty, I suspect, decisions of is this appropriate or not for GURPS. What are some of them? Well, there have been lots of detailed decisions from time to time, um, but the overriding rule is the company's got my name on it, and if I wouldn't allow it at my table, it's not going into one of the books. Hmm. Good. It's a good rule of thumb. thumb. Yeah, that's actually a good rule of thumb. I like that. Which, which shows that your table must be fascinating since you're the company of Munchkin, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> And Munchkin probably pushes some boundaries that it wouldn't it wouldn't be pushing if it were brand new rather than twenty years old. Some of the uh, some of the cheeky cartoon art is a little bit embarrassing now, but it's part of the brand, and uh, people people expect it, people tolerate it, and laugh at it. And I'm a huge fan of John Kovalik. So we just take it and run. But yeah, this is the 20th year for Munchkin. It's doing something right. Yeah. I, I mean, I still play the game. So <laughs> I, I, I was at a science conference on a cruise ship with a bunch of astronomers and physicists. And we had three Munchkin tables going by after dinner every night. Ha! And Jody and I beat them all every night. But anyhow. Dude, there's can so I many jokes that one can make about a kiss. Yeah, yeah. What's, your, what's your favorite munchkin? Oh, My, mine? Or Bill's? Yeah. Which Anybody's. One? Well, uh, what were the astronomers we, playing? Well, we were playing, playing the basic game in dwarves most of the time. Um, personally, I like to throw in Shakespeare. I love that one. My, my son and I play a ton of Adventure Time munchkin, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, Shakespeare was conceived on a cruise ship. Was it? <laughs> Yes, Andrew and I were on the Joko cruise, and one of the panels that we did was, was you know, help us think of your dream munchkin. And the arguments for Shakespeare were so good, and there were so many great suggestions right there, that long story short, we did it. Odds bodkins, forsooth. Yay, verily. Slipping back vaguely towards the RPG and storytelling topic here. Oh, very well. Just because Alexei will be concerned if we don't, or Eric. Um, 
Inv you are all successful storytellers and successful RPG put, put people doing it. There are going to be lots of people looking into this that either want to do their own system or are taking notes so they can send you their product next week so that you can look at it. My sympathies. I'm retired. Um, so the question is, what, what would you advise people who are today putting together either a scenario or RPG to do? What should they look at? What should they be thinking about when they're doing it? That's good advice for it. And Marion, we've started with everyone else every time, so I'll leave you on the spot to start this time. Uh, again, I've only got the one RPG game book and a source book under my belt now. Um, but I would say my advice going to Kickstarter is if you're going to go the independent route, which I did for that publication, um, make sure you've got it 90% done when you do the Kickstarter. Even if you're putting twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, you know, up front in your own money. Rick is pointing somewhere. Yeah, I'm pointing to you. Uh, oh uh, yeah. Uh, I was like, yes, absolutely. It's on my screen. What you're below said. me. What uh, he said. Yes. Right. My mine. I I all I wanted when I when I did the Kickstarter was ten grand for the for the print run. Um, it closed about sixty grand with the backer kit in it, so it was you know very successful. But it was also a successful completion because. The game book was 90% finished when I did the Kickstarter. And uh, the, the, the readers liked it so much, they were willing to wait an extra year for the source book, which wasn't 90% finished when I did the Kickstarter. <laughs> Steve, what advice would you to give, give to people who are going to be writing and working on RPGs and submissions over the next year or two? Well, remember that you are not I mean, as, as the scenario writer, you're not writing a story, you're writing about a story. You're creating situations and characters, but you need to leave multiple paths for resolution so the GM and the players all have agency. Uh, I know we keep, we keep hitting this agency note, but it's an important note. It's middle C. Uh, Could you uh, expand on that maybe with an example? Uh, yes, the, the alternative, uh, the thing we don't want to see is a railroad game. Not, and I'm not talking about the kind of railroad game that Mayfair made famous. I'm talking about the game where the scenario sets up a situation and then makes all of the decisions so that the game master is reduced to reading a lot of things from books mm -hmm. uh, or from uh, from the book and if anyone steps off course they have to be herded back onto it don't do that that is a bad thing sandbox we not railroad yes Yep. Right. I mean, there's a, you know, narrative guides and uh, there's a, that's a whole separate how to do a storytelling like thing with a panel that I could go on, but that's, uh, yes, player agency is key. And the definition of player agency is allowing choice. Yes. In the storytelling. Meaningful choice. Meaningful choice. As, as the person who started Choose Your Path games in the 80s for people, books for in the 80s, mm -hmm. It, it turned out you had to have meaningful choice. And the dirty secret with, with Chosen Path books is, and I don't know if it works in storytelling or not, is they'll hit a point and there'll be five distinct choices and they'll go on five different paths. But at some point, you've got to tie them together to, to, to get to the end of the scenario. Is this also true in a role play game? No. Do you have to redirect them or can you leave, leave the end a bush instead of a tree? You can leave the end a bush. You can have multiple endings. And uh, you can talk to the game master about how they can blend things from the different endings that you give to allow for what the players really do. Mm -hmm. Give them what they deserve, not what's on page 38. Yeah, and it, it, if that becomes a lot easier to do, sure, if you're, story, if you're ever storytelling and you don't craft out your entire campaign world before your players sit down, you just have, oh, here's your next adventure. And then you write the next one based off the player's choices in the one prior. Uh, that actually helps prevent you from falling into that trap. 
True. Okay. I, I totally agree. It's, right. it's got to be that way. The nothing question, to add there. Pardon? I said there's nothing to add there, yes. No. The 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 if we're we're talking about open storytelling, that is a direct conflict with licensed scenarios, which are set in a if it's based on a movie or something or a TV series, a fairly narrow, narrow set of world. And you often have little quirks like don't kill off Captain Kirk or something like that. Uh, we could not destroy Superman, only DC could do that when they're trying to end their brand. Um, I have a particular oh, have to, you in particular have to battle with this. You've licensed probably more things than everybody else on this panel together, a factor of three for GURPS. You have a ton of licensed GURPS things. How does that constrain what you do? Uh, it means that we are not doing character driven stuff, at least not driven mm. by the main characters. Uh, when we did the GURPS Vorkosigan license, for instance, uh, we, working, working with uh, Bujold was great, uh, but uh, we, we not only didn't recommend that people play her hero Miles, uh, we kind of recommended that you not even have Miles in the scenario because he would take everything over just like he did in all the books. Mm -hmm. Instead, you drive the, uh, or you describe the background and let the background uh, drive what's going on. And maybe Miles comes uh, on screen toward the end to tell them they did all right. Okay. How it, much it, problem it, is the Superman scenario? That was my personal hell. And I mean that in a non-obscene manner. It was my difficult thing. We had to put Superman in a game with Batman and other normal characters. It's not, it's not obscene, it's profane. It's uh, difficult. Okay. As a storyteller, my response would have just opened up the adventure with uh, the death of those characters. Like that's how I would just like if I would actually had to run. I've never the one thing I've never done is I've never run in a like licensed IP property that was like that specific with canon characters. If I'm gonna run superheroes. I'm just gonna go run Necessary Evil or like you know make my own like mutants world. Um, but if I ever had to do that, the first thing I would do is I would take those characters out of play yeah, almost indeed. instantly because I can't tell a story and my players can't tell a story when they're constrained and we by those characters. Sold Eleven games in the world <laughs> had we done that. You can't sell a DC Heroes role-playing game without Superman oh. and Batman in it. So. Oh yeah, no, I just met at my table. Like I would have like at the table, I would have taken like, here's the world setting. And then I would have had something really cool with what happens in the table. I'd still want those characters in the book though, so that I would know where you guys as the writers were thinking how they would play out. Cause that would be I cool. Mean, you gotta well, have the character stats in the book. Oh, sorry, go on Mary. I'm just going to say, I mean, because I, 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 I fondly remember the uh, GURPS for Kosigan set. And, of course, you had the, all the characters were there statted out. And it, it, I loved Miles' stats, by the way. The way you described him was great. But uh, you're, oh, you you got to do both things. you gotta, you got to have those mainline characters in there because people are opening the book expecting to see them. Uh, but, yeah, you, again, you can't make them the primary characters or, or even drop in uh, in cases like Miles or Superman. Uh, without taking over the scene. So. By, by the way, the, the thing I put in that we finally cheated with was we created this Superman rule that if his, he is within 50 yards of other characters, he loses his self-will and has to do what they tell him to to assist them. <laughs> that's good. That, that's how we, if you read our books, our modules carefully, Superman shows up and then Batman calls all the shots. And Batman is smarter than he was. And, back, and Superman just acts as sort of a backup and lets them do it. You know, that happened in the comics a lot, too, come to think of it. Yeah, it's like Justice League Unlimited right there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, um, Len Wein is the one who gave me the idea. Who <laughs> used to write this. All right. What is... the just, just three designers here or licensors. You're all designers. If there was another product out there, a book, that you would love to do, but it would be very difficult 
to do as an RPG. What, what's out there that you think would make, is a brilliant book that would make a very difficult RPG for you to create? What would be hard to do? What would, a book, movie, anything? That you so you're saying, you're saying a book that you'd dearly love to see as an RPG, but it No, is... I'm saying a book that is a good book that would be mm -hmm. very difficult for you to create an RPG around. Is there anything out there you've thought about and gone, ah? <laughs> well, that was my reaction to the original Illuminatus trilogy by uh -huh. Shay and Wilson. A uh, completely ungameable book. It wasn't until it occurred to me to ignore the book and go back to the source material that I was able to get anywhere at all with Illuminati. So I always honor that trilogy as being what made me think of it, but it's but the game is not based on the books. There's no way you could base a coherent game on those books. They're too to freewheeling, they go in all directions at once. I, I must admit that mine came from a different direction. Back when I was doing RPG at Mayfair, Gene Wolfe was a close personal friend in his Tales of the Executioner. Ooh, yeah. Were, were brilliantly written, genius to write 500 words a day and take all day and concentrate on it. Every word was poetry. He had brilliant books about a really lovable, sadistic, murdering, torturing executioner for an evil empire. And it was an incredibly successful series. And we looked at that for a while, and then I gave it to someone who wasn't a, a big science fiction fan and said, what do you think of this? And they said, we can't do this. Okay, uh, the torturer, you mean, not executioner. Yeah, torturer. The, the torturer, yeah. there we go. The torturer, sorry. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, we did the books of the new sun for yeah. GURPS. The background is brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, just that particular character uh, falls under the heading of someone I wouldn't want at my table. Yeah, for sure. We tried, and Gene wanted us to, and I, he lived down the road from me. And we just went, sorry, Gene. Mm. How, about I, how about you, Rick? So um, my friends and I uh, all have a game that we would basically gamify every single movie or every single book that we read. So I honestly can't think of a single fantasy science fiction novel that I couldn't f turn into a role-playing game that I've oh, read. Uh, now, non-science fiction and, and fantasy, um, you know, honestly, I played games like Weird Wars. Um, and one of the stories was, uh, Viet I, I used to be big into war. Uh, war novels. And I read a lot of books on Vietnam and like the X zone and, and things like that, that were actual just true history of like, here's the story from soldiers that were, were out there. And even taking those because of game systems that Savage Worlds has, like, um, forget that, that would be a, it wouldn't be a fun game. I would have to add an alternative history to it. Um, I would always have to spice it up. But like my real life day job is an electrician in Chicago. Most of my crazy urban fantasy uh, horror stories are because I've opened up like panels underneath the city and like had cockroaches swarm over me or I found weird Illuminati symbols baked into like the Chicago Board of Trade. So like the that. real the real life uh, freaking experiences that I have like fuel my imagination anyway. So as long as I can take something and still add my imagination and put a spin on it, I could probably do it. The one that would be really hard though wasn't that I that I don't know how to do yet. I'd have to think about it. Is an anime. Uh, there's this uh, show Neon Genesis Evangelion that was written by uh, you know, <laughs> right? Like like to turn that into a playable RPG. Like like the world is cool. There's so much stuff there, but it's like, how do you how do you do that? Right? Like because the story is so definitive, here's the end of the world, and it happens. I mean, there probably is an RPG for it out there in Japan somewhere. Somebody's probably already done it. If they haven't, that would be one that I would love to turn into an RPG, but I would have to give some serious thought on, hey, how do I do this? Yeah, and after every other scene, you're left going, what did I just see? <laughs> right, it's like, ah. Oh. You know, like Battle Angel Alita, great. Hey, that's an amazing one. I can turn that into an RPG. No freaking problems. What do you have to give a second thought about? Evangelion? I, my soul would be crushed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, brings it, that brings it to my choice, actually. Um, 
Are you guys familiar with Barry Hugart's The Bridge of Birds? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the best fantasy novels of the past 20 years, as far as I'm concerned. Japanese, Chinese storytelling format, though. Yeah, well, yes. Um, the I think difficulty, it's though. Man, but yes, so the, all the, the Master the, Lee books are, are brilliant. Master Lee and Number 10 Ox. Um, yeah. The difficulty would not be the setting. The setting is brilliantly conceived, but it's basically imperial mythical China. And an RPG book could reproduce it pretty faithfully. The problem is, and this goes what to Rick was saying, is a role-playing game does not just re replicate the world. You're trying to replicate the experience of the reader or the viewer who's coming at it from the TV series or from the book series or whatever. They want to have the experience, not just the world background. Um, but uh, Bridge of Birds is one long high story where, where the, the main character is this incredibly intelligent, amazingly brilliant person. And you can't have gamers play that story, nothing close to it. And, and the humor is the other element too, to be very hard to reproduce. So I think there's a lot of games out there. I think anybody could, anybody could reproduce any world background, but the story, the, the experience, going back to the storytelling, those would be hard. I think I'll, give you a series. I'll challenge you on that. I'll give you a series to read and that is the future history of Cornwainer Smith, which are told in the Japanese storytelling style. And there's okay. only about 200,000 words. If you can turn that into an RPG, you've done an amazing thing. I think that a really good referee could run a Master Lee number 10 Ox campaign and the table would have a really good time. And uh, you could do that with, with any system you wanted, as long as it was allowed you to be heavy on the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't need a special background book because it is mythical imperial China. But writing a book to empower that, that would be hard. Yes. I, just I will agree with you, do... a, a master GM can do it, yes. I just figured out how to do Evangelion. I would use the 10 candles system. That's what I would do it around. Because you have all the different angels that come and every time you blow out one of the candles, that angel has come and you go to the next scene and you fade to black and at the very, very end, everybody plays the tape recording of their messages of their last moments before they were alive when they started off the, uh, the game. And so the game would be a 10 short run horror story. That, wow. that, 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 that would be functional, but is a bit of a cheat on the <laughs> RPG format. Well, no, have you, ever, have you ever seen the 10 Candles game yes, system? Yes, but I'm afraid that using that for that would be a bit of a cheat as far as an RPG. And your expansion would be really difficult to write. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't think you can expand it. You're already left with depression at the end. RPG, you can't expand, you can't make money. Look at GURPS. All right, we are actually- cheat, But it sounds like a good cheat. Yes. It is. I, I, good thought. Um, we're actually running towards the end of the time we have here. And so what I'd like these talented people to do is each one of you tell us what you've got coming in the future. I'll begin with I'm finishing a novel that recreates the history of the Mongol Empire 20 years in the future and using powered armor. Dave Drake inspired. Well, Rick, what are you working on in your next project? Uh, so currently, my project is actually live on Kickstarter right now. It's the Red Opera, Last Days of the Warlock. Uh, and then my you, you can find that at theredopera.com. It'll take you right there. You can listen to some epic metal music. Uh, my book, uh, The Seventh Age Dawn, just got uh, published by Prince of Cats uh, Publishing. You can find that everywhere. And my sequel will hopefully be out next year, Seventh Age Dystopia. And again, it's sarcastic urban fantasy about the end of the world or what happens when corporations uh, get their hands on magic and decide to commoditize that. Mary. Ooh. Sorry, was that my turn? Yes. Okay, um, obviously I'm, I'm working hard on book nine, which will be out this year for the Wearing the Cape novel series. That's my main project. Um, I do have some uh, plot bunnies, so to speak, the game version of plot bunnies in my head that I'm, uh, now that I got my toe dipped in fate, um, I'm coming out with various small fate hacks that are going up on drive through RPG as they're published. Um, so I, I expect a couple more of those by the end of the year. I don't expect to return to wearing the cape role-playing game for a little while, but 
might be something in the works for 2021. And for he who just might have more than all of us put together and certainly has in the past, Steve, what's coming? Well, culturally, we're still working on reinventing Steve Jackson Games as a distributed online, everybody works at home company. We have been getting through COVID without laying anybody off. And I, I, yeah, yeah that, yeah, nice. That has felt like a win in, in the game of life. Um, as far as my own projects, I'm uh, shepherding a new edition of Tom Jolly's game, Wiz War, to the printer. It's almost ready to get there. And my own writing right now is mostly for Munchkin, 20 years, woo, and for the Fantasy Trip, which is our old school hack and slash role-playing game based on that one little thing that I wrote back in 77. Melee, right? Melee, yes. Melee. Uh, a year ago at Gen Con, you know, you remember back in the prior year before, before Plague Walked and all that, mm -hmm. talking about the new Star Wars, the uh, new Car Wars. Probably. Yes, that is at the printer and has been for some time. It, it, it's proving to be a huge challenge for the factory because there's just so much in the box. So it is not on its Kickstarter schedule, but it's progressing. And it's going to be awesome. Yeah, a little secret. When we got tired of RPG and we mad at each other, we'd play Car Wars in the early days of yeah, Dude, I... I love Car Wars. That's the, we use that stuff for. Um, I actually splash that into a few other Thank game you. systems. So, uh, like no, it's it's one of those things. It's a game system that you can grab, and even if you're running some other game system or doing some other thing, you could actually splash that in and be like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna go with this. And now for our final question, with a one or two sentence answer, and then we'll sign off. I'll ask each of you. If when you were 18 years old, you knew what you knew now and you had a choice of going into this again or not, going into gaming and RPG, what would you tell your 18 year old self in one sentence? You have a 10 second window to go through time. Marion, what Do would it you first. tell yourself? Do it now. I wouldn't waste basically 20 years doing other careers. Rick? Don't quit your day job. <laughs> um, no, no, uh, I, I would, I would stay, I would start up say, uh, God, that's a hard one because I love it. I would never go. I would always do this again. This has been amazing. So I would say start sooner. Yeah, Steve? start sooner. I wouldn't waste any of that 10 seconds on talking about gaming. I would have much more important things to tell myself. <laughs> yeah. We'd have to and buy Apple and IBM at 10. <laughs> so. All right. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for the insights and everything else and for the wonderful products you're all creating. And thank you for appearing on the Ring of Fire RPG Gaming and Storytelling panel. Well, thank you. Thank for, you for having us. For thank you. having us. And uh, Eric, good job. And nice to meet you, Steve and Eric. You mm -hmm. guys take mm -hmm. care. Gentlemen.